Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today we are going to take a quick look at Ronin, a samurai-themed solo RPG, and then we are also going to talk about one of my favorite Japanese-themed martial arts movies, and that is the animated feature from 1985 called The Dagger of Kamui. So Ronin has uh, been talked about quite a bit in various uh, the Dungeon Dive Facebook group and uh, various other solo RPG uh, forums and groups that I like to participate in. And so I'm a little Johnny come lately on the video side of things, but I've had the game for a while. I just haven't gotten it to the table yet. And I did it last week and I am super glad that I finally did because this is a really cool game. So this game is from, it's uh, published by Coisina Verde, which I believe is a Brazilian company, a uh, Brazilian publishing company. I think the uh, game originated in Portuguese and it has been translated into English. I mention that fact only because the translation is just a little bit on the rough side but in no way does it get in the way of the fun of the game. And Ronin is a game that offers a lot of fun, especially if you are looking for something a little bit uh, different, a little bit different theme than a lot of the games that we like to play, which are usually more fantasy or more sci science fiction themed games. Ronin is not a journaling game, although you can keep a journal if you want to get more into the story, if you want to um, detail more of the connections between the dots, between the plot dots that the game lays out for you as you are rolling on many random charts during your adventure. Let's read a little bit about Ronin here. It says that Ronin is a narrative solo game in which the player builds the story of a wandering uh, of a wanderer in search of redemption. To play this game, you will need book, pencil, eraser, and two normal six-sided dice of different colors. The focus of this game is to play in a fictional Japan based on the Japanese feudal era, era the shogunate era, when samurai were the ruling class, especially the Sengoku period. The daimyo held military power over entire regions while vying for political influence among themselves. This game is not meant to be true to Japan's rich history, but if you have that knowledge and want to use it in-game, you just have to change the name and classification of the clans. So in this game, and in this game book, you are going to be taking a single character, a ronin, who is out for redemption and possibly revenge. You're going to be building your ronin, you're going to be rolling dice, having random encounters, building the story as your ronin is out wandering Japan, searching for or maybe being hunted down by three different villains. The first two main villains are kind of like mini bosses, and the third villain is going to be your final boss fight that you have to overcome in order to win the game. In doing so, you're going to be taking this character sheet here. In the upper left-hand portion, you're going to have your Ronin character. And then below that, you're going to have a section to keep your allies, your possible allies who you can meet and then charm to become allies. And depending on their occupation, they will be helping your Ronin on certain things during the game. You have a section here to keep track of the four noble clans that you might be meeting along the way. And then also finally a section here to keep track of all the various enemies that you're going to come across and fight. The game book is uh, organized in such a way that it, it, uh, it leads off with the main rules for how you're going to be rolling the dice, how you're going to be building your character, and stitching the story together and writing your saga. So while Ronin is not strictly a journaling game, I think some people will find a lot of benefit in keeping a small journal so they can embellish the story because the game does a really good job at giving you just enough to kind of create these cinematic images in your head of these exciting set pieces, but it doesn't do, um, a, there isn't a lot there to connect those various points of interest. So if that is something that is um, important to you in a narrative game, then it is kind of up to you 
to embellish upon those story moments. And it's very easy to do because of the information that the book gives you. Your character is very simple in the game. It, uh, your character only has three main stats, and that is reputation, compassion, and determination. Reputation is a stat that as it builds, the main villains will know more about you and it will become easier for them to track you down and you will have to face them. Compassion is a stat that you gain or lose depending on whether or not you kill or let your opponents live after fighting them. And determination is a stat that you can spend to re-roll dice. There are also a number of different non-player characters, NPCs that you can meet throughout the game. And those are the villains, those are the basic enemies, and then the possible allies that you can meet and you can charm them so they can become your allies. Uh, this page here, page eight, it's kind of like the only real main complaint I have about the game. The information on this page to me just feels a little out of place because here we have a section about the journey and about leaving the trail. Uh, this is a section that you can use to embellish your journey, to add things that maybe your character is looking for or hiding from. And so I think this should probably be more in line with the, uh, the information about the journey. And whereas this little section here, the redemption, this is the chart you roll on at the end of the game. So I would have rather have seen this come at the end of the book, just where it makes logical sense. But those really two are the those really are the only two major complaints I have about the game. Chapter two introduces the introduct the um, interaction rules. So depending on the type of um, NPC you are encountering, an ally, a possible ally, an enemy, or a villain, this chart tells you how you can interact with them. If you can talk, charm, intimidate, or fight them. And then you have the rules for doing those specific things, for talking, for charming, for intimidating, and for fighting, and for perhaps learning a dark secret, which the dark secret doesn't have any mechanical uh, bearing on the game, but it does allow you to, uh, to bolster the narrative. Then finally here we will get into the combat section. Combat in this game is very fast, it is very deadly, and it is very simple. At its basic, at its core, you are rolling two dice, one for you, one for your opponent, whose ever um, total is the highest wins. Depending on your fighting technique, or depending on your allies, or depending on other uh, circumstances, you might have bonuses to those rolls. Additionally, depending on your fighting technique, you might also have a block value and your opponent might also have a block value. Blocking is a currency that you can spend and it replenishes at the top of each encounter that you can spend a point of block in order to force a reroll, a reroll of one of the dice. So that is really important because my fighting technique, I had a plus zero in my fighting, but I had four to my blocking skill. So that saved my butt quite a few times. There are no hit points in this game. You either win the fight or you don't. And then once you win the fight, you can choose to let your opponent live, in which case you're going to be gaining a point of reputation because they go out and spread the name, your name throughout the world, saying what a great fighter you are, that they were bested by you, and that uh, brings you to the villain's attention. Or you can kill them, and when you kill them, you will lose a point of compassion. And compassion is a stat that you use in order to charm allies and other little things like that. So you either win or lose. When you lose, you roll a d6 and you might die on, I think it's on a roll of a, a it, you are defeated in combat, you must roll a dice. If the result is two or more, your character wakes up wounded. So if you roll a one, you die. But that is not necessarily the end of the game because narratively you can take another character who might be a family member or maybe a member of the same clan as you, or maybe a friend that you have met along the way, maybe one of your allies, and then they can continue the search for the main villains if you have discovered them. So it has a narrative way to continue the game that you are playing in now when your character dies. If not, they will get wounded, and wounded is just a state that if you are wounded, you do worse in combat roles until you become healed. So very easy fighting, 
It's very fast. You don't have to do a whole bunch of rolls. You're basically just doing one roll unless there is a block and you don't have to keep track of hit points or anything like that. And then we get into chapter three here, which is all about creating your Ronin. And you have various tables that you're going to roll on. You have male names, female names, and appearance. So my Ronin was a male named Riku Shin. He has bluish hair and he is blind. So after you determine some of your appearance, you're going to be rolling on your technique. There are a number of basic techniques and then there are uncommon techniques. And here are some uh, pictorial depictions of some of the different techniques. I rolled on an uncommon chart and I was a uh, I was versed in the Tonfu fighting or Tonfa, I should say. And for those of you who are not familiar with what a Tonfa is, I actually drew mine here. They were uh, wooden, usually wooden weapons. In modern days, they are made out of metal, but they are a short staff with a handle and you hold the, the handle and the staff goes along your arm. They are very good for blocking and for disarming opponents. Very cool weapons. I always love Tonfa. I, I always love to see them in martial arts movies because they are kind of a unique weapon. And that gave me a plus zero to my fight, but it did allow me to block four times, like I said. Very cool. And then you're going to roll on a little chart about your family. My family was a plebeian family. And then you are also going to roll on, uh, you might have a scar, you might have a meaning to that scar, and then a recurring nightmare. And so uh, my, I my nightmares are uh, laying in the street in the rain. My scars, I have cuts on my leg. And for my background, I said that my family was killed by a small clan, the Sasori Keru clan. And I was tortured and blinded with uh, my legs were whipped and cut. And so my uh, main journey, my quest is to get revenge for what that clan did to me and my family. And so that is kind of uh, how I am starting my journey. Then you have a little chart here so you can come up with those four noble clans that you can plug in to various points during the story. The main part of the game is going to be on these two charts here. So you will have on each round, you will have a route, you will be traveling, and then you will arrive at a location. And depending on your reputation, while you are traveling, you might come across the major villain, or you might come across a road encounter, or maybe nothing happens. And then when you arrive at a, at a location, you will usually have to do some kind of fight or you might have to roll on the urban encounter charts. And then you have a D66 chart for all of your different road encounters. So you might have a road encounter that is, uh, what is that, 62. So let's look at 62 here for a road encounter. Um, a family was driving their wagon on the road and offered you a ride. If you refuse, they will leave. If accepted, roll a dice. If the result is between six and two, you made a good trip to the next city and nothing happened. Uh, but if the result is one, you have found that a member of the family is a kitsune, a treacherous yokai. She cannot be intimidated. And if you try to talk and lose, you lose one determination and wake up without your belongings by the side of the road. Okay, that's pretty cool. So lots of neat things can happen to you while you are traveling on the road. And then once you arrive at your uh, location, you will have an urban encounter, which is another smaller kind of D66 chart for things that might happen at your location. Along the way, you might meet possible allies, which can be charmed into becoming your allies, at which point you will roll on this occupation chart, and that will give you some detail about how they can help you on your uh, journey. You might meet a mentor or a blacksmith or a healer, a fighter or an innocent. I met somebody who allowed me to have plus one to my fights. He, she was a Tomoe Sara. She's androgynous. So I said that she dresses as a man. And in a lot of martial arts cinema, uh, women dress like men so they can participate in the martial world because uh, women were discouraged from fighting often. And so they would pose as men so they could fight and get trained and so on. And then finally, once you come across your villain, you will roll on your villain charts here. Your, uh, you will have an exotic location that you will fight in a certain kind of weather. So my first villain showdown took place in a cane break, which is like a sugar cane field at night under the moonlight. And you will have a little chart here for your, uh, your, your two first villains. And then your main villain, you will roll on this final villain chart. 
and you will have uh, that final villain will have a unique power. And so you just keep rolling on charts to see how your journey went, to see what happened when you arrived at each location. And then as you gain reputation, you will be uh, visited by three villains. Once you are visited by your final villain, you will either win or lose against that uh, in that duel against the final villain. And then you can roll on your redemption chart to see how well you did in the game and what your final outcome was. I think Ronin is a very fun game. It's very simple. It's fast. You can put as much into it as you want to get as much story out of it as you want. And I do appreciate that. I was playing just very simply with little sentences, little one or uh, just a couple words for each thing that my Ronin um, encountered on his quest. But I could see some people getting really into it and keeping elaborate journals about their Ronin, maybe a map of Japan and how they have traveled around the world in order to meet that final villain, villain, get redemption and possibly get revenge. So up next, we're gonna be talking a little bit about a great uh, Japanese martial arts film called The Dagger of Kamui. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about Dagger of Kamui. Uh, this is a Japanese animated film from 1985, and it sits in the same kind of genre that Ronin does. It is a Japanese-themed martial arts animated epic. Dagger of Kamui was directed by Rin Taro, and he is a director that is very important to me. For those of you who listened to the... Um, the top five, the, the five great science fiction anime uh, podcast that I did, you would know how much I love Galaxy Express 999. And Rin Taro was actually the director of the uh, film versions, the, the, the uh, cinematic versions of Galaxy Express 999, the movie and the follow up adieu Galaxy Express. He is also responsible for one of the segments in the great collection, Neo Tokyo. He directed Metropolis, uh, a great OVA series called Peacock King, and he worked on Doom Megalopolis. Um, additionally, Rintaro was also the co-founder of the production house, uh, the production studio called Madhouse. And uh, Dagger of Kamui was produced by Madhouse. And Madhouse is one of the best, one of the most important producers of Japanese animation ever in history. Uh, they have worked on some of the things mentioned above, but also Wicked City, Twilight of the Cockroaches, X, Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust, Redline, Record of Lodos Wars, Goku Midnight Eye, Demon City Senjuku, and segments for the Laeji Matsumoto um, collection, The Cockpit, and The Animatrix, and so many more. Just look up Madhouse on the Wikipedia and you'll see just how many important things uh, that they uh, contributed to. So Dagger of Kamui is from 1985. It is sets, uh, it's, it's nestled in my favorite era of Japanese animation. And that is from like the 80s into the 90s when the country was injecting a lot of money because they had this roaring economy and they were injecting a ton of money into their uh, animated films and a whole new sector of straight to video animation that was all very, very high quality. So Dagger of Kamui clocks in at over 120 minutes, so it is very much an epic film. It was released on VHS in a very, very edited version in the U.S., and that was called Revenge of the Ninja Warrior, and that was actually the way that I first experienced this movie. The, Jap the, the U.S. version is only 90 minutes long, so like 30 plus minutes were cut from the movie to make it a more of a kid's movie. And that happened a lot in the like late 80s, early 90s in America. We had versions of Macross, Do You Remember Love, that were highly edited. That was called Clash of the Bionoids. And that was actually my first introduction to the Macross movie after, you know, being experienced uh, or um, exposed to the, the Robotech television show. And then also uh, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind was released in a highly edited form called Warriors of the Wind. 
But Dagger of Kamui, like I said, is a true epic. It is a globe-trotting adventure story featuring ninjas, ronin, uh, assassins, treasure hunting, magic, cowboys, demons, action, drama, and even Mark Twain. Yes, Mark Twain makes an appearance in animated form. It deals with political intrigue, uh, questions about race and people finding their place in the world. It deals with stories of, of, of revenge, of retribution, of redemption, and tons and tons of action. Action. It takes place in a variety of settings. You have like Japanese villages and forests and lakes. At one point, there is a quick trip over to Russia and even a quick trip over to the United States where our lead character meets a slave named Sam. And he also interacts with a with a, a, a tribal people and he meets a young native girl and he helps the tribal people out. He also gets into duels with cowboys. So it, it's almost like tangentially kind of a weird Western in some ways. The whole thing is about a young boy named Jiro, and Jiro discovers that his mother and sister have been murdered in his home, and the villagers come into his house while he is discovering this, and they think that he did it. So he has to run away from the village. He is tricked into a mission that, uh, in, that where he ends up killing another important family member. And all this is wrapped around this plot to find uh, uh, pirate treasure, Captain Kidd's treasure, and to use that treasure, to use that wealth in that treasure in order to help an evil clan rise to power in Japan. The art and music are totally unique. It has a very strong psychedelic vibe to it. It really does, even though it's an early 80s movie, a mid 80s movie, to me, it really feels like a, a strong movie from the 70s. Um, it's like, imagine if Sergio Leone, um, Akira Kurosawa, and, and uh, Jodorowsky, imagine if they all teamed up to make a martial arts anime. You would get something like Dagger of Kamui. The, the, the music is this mix of like prog rock and vocal chanting which adds a completely unique layer that you don't hear often in um, animated films. And it uses a lot of very stylistic color and abstract imagery during the fight scenes to create a strong dreamlike quality that is often contrasted by moments of blunt violence and quiet drama. Dagger of Kamui, I think, is, is really an underrated masterpiece of the medium. It's a movie that I don't hear talked about a lot, and that could be just because it is kind of hard to find. Uh, there's only a somewhat poor quality. It's an okay quality DVD released in the United States. I don't believe it's been released on Blu-ray. It has not been remastered outside of Japan, as far as I know. I, I don't even know if it's been remastered in Japan. It seems to be this kind of like forgotten classic, but it deserves the same kind of attention outside of Japan that, you know, Western audiences give to movies like uh, Princess Mononoke or perhaps um, Paprika or these kind of like big uh, prestige movies. Uh, Dagger of Movie is up there with those movies, I think. It's action-packed. It's got a really good story. It's got interesting drama and characters. And it's just, it's a great globe-trotting adventure that I absolutely love. If you haven't seen it, I, I recommend tracking it down, even though it can be quite difficult to find. Um, I have seen DVDs. There are some old DVDs on Amazon, and I have seen DVDs of it pop up on eBay from time to time. But yes, if you're in, if you're searching for something, if you're playing Ronin, and you're like, man, I want to watch a movie that gives me the same kind of feeling as Ronin, or this uh, a, a really cool kind of fantasy um, adjacent Japanese martial arts animated film. Yeah, check out Dagger of Kamui from 1985, director Rentaro. All right, guys, we'll hope you enjoyed this look at Ronin and this look at Dagger of Kamui. We will talk to you later. Bye bye.